In the world of wine, there is nothing more magnificent than a twisted old vine. But the reason why we should care for them is not always so immediate. What should we take in consideration when talking about old vines? My returning guest, Sarah Abbott, runs the Old Vine Conference. We discuss what are the values of old vines for the industry and how the global wine community can support them. In this episode, Sarah talks about what she aims to achieve with her conferences. We delve into the orders that a vine needs to overcome to get to old age and the economic factors. Sarah also highlights a research that shows how vines' DNA mutate in their old age, showing that they are adapting to their terroir, making them vital to the diversity pool of vines. This is the Looking Into Wine podcast, and Matthias Carpazza, your host, welcome. Hi, I'm Matthias Carpazza, and this is the Looking Into Wine podcast. Wine and wine making can be complex, but this podcast has a simple mission. We want to give you the skills and tools to harness your passion about wine. Through this series, we will shine a spotlight on some of the different regions, process and concepts that shape the fascinating world of wine. I hope you enjoy the show and your own journey, Looking Into Wine. Welcome to the Looking Into Wine. I'm Mattias Carpazza, your host, and today I welcome back to the show Sarah Abbott, Master of Wine. Sarah writes about wine for various publications, including the, the World of Fine Wine and Timakin.com. Sarah, she's also been previously a guest on the show to talk about the wines of Prosecco Valdobbiadene Superiore. Be sure to check that episode out. And today, she's here to talk about her latest venture, the Old Vine Conference. We'll be talking about what makes uh, Old Vine special and why we should preserve them and more. Welcome to the show, Sara. Thank you for having me, Mattia. <laughs> it's a pleasure, it's a pleasure. So, wh- why did you decide to, to start this Old Vine Conference? What was the epitome? Yes, okay. Well, it came about through various conversations with fellow wine colleagues, through, I guess you would call it my own great interest over many years in the history and heritage and and, and kind of the way that, of, of wine and the way that if you look at the continuation of wine, it basically carries the story of humanity and connects humanity in many different ways and connects humanity to nature. So my degree was um, classical and ancient history, and I'm really interested in the the deep time of wine. And how this came about, the Old Vine Conference is a non-profit, and we founded it, myself and my co-founders, Leo Austin and Alan Griffiths, MW. Initially, we founded it because they were launching they wanted to launch a range of wines that were all about working with old vine parcels Mm -hmm. and they came to me because they asked for my help in doing a conventional launch and in the conversations that we had I gave them so many reasons why this was a bad idea that they would need (laughs) so much help and that although there were great individuals and even organizations all over the world who really believe in the importance of this heritage yeah that there wasn't a kind of category there isn't the scent when you go into a wine shop you don't see old vine wine or you don't see heritage vineyards you know um you don't see it on wine lists and their response to that to their credit was actually you're right and we think there's a bigger picture here so let's work together and and try to bring everyone together all around the world who care about this to actually create the category. So your aim is to create awareness of old vine and try to create a, a category for old vine. It needs a place to live in the commercial wine world and it needs that place to live because at the moment many really beautiful, high quality, deeply culturally significant old vineyards 
are lost. We're losing them very rapidly. They're being grubbed up because mm-hmm. the belief or the previous experience has been that they can't be made to pay commercially. So although many people in the wine business and certainly many growers and winemakers really value old vine fruit, it's more often than not not the case that it is valued commercially. And it's a lot more expensive to tend, yep. to cultivate, farm these these vineyards. So you have to create a category which can command more money. And I've, we know it can be done because certain countries or regions have succeeded in doing it. But you really yep. need it to have resonance in the major wine markets, offering wine from all over the world to make the difference. So what what, what regions are they? Because I know that you have you've been working with some of those regions. I, I, I read there's some country they're working quite hard. Well, how are they operating? What what they're doing to preserve their old vines? That's a really good question. And I started researching this it must be nearly two years ago now. Um, and I I think that probably the one one of the, well I think the benchmark for a really successful integrated approach for identifying old, good old vineyards, um, protecting them, ensuring that they're being maintained to the very best quality and that the people who are working them understand how to Mm -hmm. farm them and are rewarded properly for it. So you take all that to the viticultural side and then um, you need to make sure that this great old vine fruit is then valued by winemakers who might be growing it um, Mm -hmm. and that it um, doesn't necessarily just disappear into a generic blend and that you then find a way to talk about it and market Mm -hmm. it and have it actually um, achieve higher prices (laughs) in shops and in restaurants that's what you need and there's one country that has done that as a complete holistic success and that's the South African Old Vine Project and um, they have a category called Heritage Vineyards this was um, a project that was really kicked off by um, Rosa Kruger who's a viticulturalist Mm -hmm. and they started out with a you know a handful of producers who signed up to the heritage vineyards seal, yeah. seal on their winery, the the logo on their bottle, and they now have scores. In fact, I, um, I know it's definitely well over fifty. <laughs> it may <laughs> even be close to a hundred now. They have absolutely scores of top, wonderful producers in South Africa who are signed wow. up to this project, um, and. Not only have they got this massive engagement, but they've yeah. also conducted research in association with Stellenbosch University to analyze whether the, having the heritage vineyard seal on a bottle has a an impact on the consumer perception. And, and it does. So they've done so well at communicating this that they've actually succeeded in creating, if you like, a category of what they call heritage vineyard wine. Yeah. And the, so is a, does he have a seal on the lay, on the yes. neck of the label or something? So they have um, um, a, sort of a logo that goes onto the bottle. They also have um, really, really, really attractive sort of signs that go on to the outside of the winery so that they're oh. um, a certified heritage vineyard winery. They managed to bring everyone together consensus to agree a charter a charter of standards to which people must sign up if they want to join and i am full of admiration for what they've achieved because to create this kind of integrated campaign it has had an impact across the industry because one of the things that andre and rosa worked on is that they spoke with some of the biggest wine making companies the biggest buyers of grapes yeah and they brought those buyers into the project 
So they persuaded those buyers that it was in their interests to make old vine wine and market old vine wine and pay a higher price for old vine fruit. So that's South Africa. You, you basically with because I think we need to do a little bit of housekeeping because you do you run in these conferences and uh, you basically trying to create then something. Yes. Bringing this sort of idea of uh, creating a protocol and showing then it works to the rest of the world and bringing awareness to this. Well, how does uh, how many times are you planning to do these uh, conferences? Uh, and what is uh, the plan for, for that? Yes. So we held the first conference online. We call them a conference. It's quite a grand name, actually, for what uh, for a kind of um, an online conversational interview hosted by brilliant journalists with great practitioners of old vine expertise. And the first conference that we had was held in March of this year. And we had speakers from the um, historic, from the Save the Old campaign in Lodi, California. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Amazing old vines in Lodi, old vines in. And we had Stuart Spencer, who spoke to us about their campaign. We actually had Rosa and Andre from South Africa. Um, and we also had um, individual growers. So we had the first one in March. We had the second one in July. Um, yep. And the speakers in July included... Um, we, we brought in some more sort of academics and applied researchers. So we had yep. Dylan Grigg from Australia, Dr. Dylan Grigg, who is a... Um, well, a viticulturalist, you know, he's a really hands-on viticulturalist, yeah. but he's also a consultant. And yeah. he has researched old vines for his doctoral thesis, which was awarded at the highest level and is a, a really fascinating piece of research. Um, we do actually link to it from oldvines.org. And then we had mm-hmm. speakers from Chile, from Argentina, Laura Catena. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. from Bolivia, uh, Nyangauda, who's making wine from 200-year-old arboreal vines in Bolivia. Wow. And we had two uh, growers, both in France, who have succeeded really on a, um, a shoestring in promoting old vine uh, viticulture through memberships and um, and through adopt an old vine. I'm going to put the links for the for the conference and the show so people who are listening they're going to be able to find it in the show notes. And also you as you were you telling me earlier that you have another one in September and you're planning yes. to do two or three uh, two or three years and then. Uh, possibly some live oh we'll one. definitely do some live we we do hold actually we we do hold um tastings of old fine wine and um and we ticket them and the proceeds go back to the non-profit so that we can continue to sustain the organization as soon as you have one in, uh, in the uk i'll be sure to to come oh, in it would be, it would be lovely sounds... to have you yeah that would be great <laughs> I think it's been very interesting to understand why we should preserve the old vine. And uh, what what did you learn through this? What was uh, for you the two new things that you learn through this conference that you didn't realize before? And I think that's a great question. Well, so, the thing that I have come to understand is that the the way that vines cultivated. Plant, vines that are planted and cultivated with a view to long-term life are already planted in sites that are um, appropriate. They are planted with a forward-looking eye to the availability of of water. They're mm-hmm. they're basically from from their genesis they are planted sustainably because if you are planting and you're thinking well i need to basically allow this vineyard to be 
really resilient on its own terms, <laughs> then yeah. you make all kinds of decisions that are really consistent with, I suppose, what you call the principles of regenerative agriculture. So I've learned a yeah. lot about regenerative agriculture and regenerative capitalism. And both of those concepts have a lot of resonance with the way that good old vine heritage and old vine viticulture is described. Yeah. The thing I hadn't realized is that actually the there's a value of good old vineyards that goes beyond even the lifespan of that particular vineyard, which is that as vines develop and grow in a given environment, they adapt to that environment and they they um, show epigenetic adaptation. Okay. And it means that they basically have, um, there, there are changes that occur in their genome. And some of these changes are inheritable. And what this means is that when you have a diversity of old vineyards that have basically developed this kind of ultra terroir adaptation, they are incredibly valuable for their genetic material. And okay. so, for example, we were talking about this with Dylan Grigg and also Laura Catena in mm -hmm. Argentina from um, Office of Catena Zapata. They were both really clear about the importance of this genetic material. And in fact, Catena Zapata have made um, so many plantings using the the cuttings, mm -hmm. the massal selections yeah. from the old vineyards. And the the value of those massal selections gives this diversity, which is robustness. And we need our vine population to be really robust because climate change is a reality. And the more diversity we can have, the more resilient and robust that vine material can be. Absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, it's interesting. I don't know if you heard of this and I'm going to just span out a second. I was looking at there is a pandemic going on with the banana plantation because they have a mono uh, planting globally and yeah. the virus got to, to South America and there is huge effort to not get this virus going around to, because we're on the verge of losing losing them and I think it's for vine uh, thankfully we have different clones of resistance but we, we you know more genetic is better we can't have the risk of not having the diversification. This is absolutely indisputable. And in fact, Jean-Philippe Roby, the associate professor at Bordeaux, spoke about this. And his argument is that it's the wrong thing to do to try to conserve a couple of plants in a kind of, you know, wine museum. <laughs> yeah. That actually simply by main, devoting 5% of a given region's hectareage to yeah. the kind of, if you like, the live, you know, in situ cultivation of old vines, which are often, the thing about old vines is that they are often the way that we are able to hold on to old varieties. Yeah. Because there's a big move for the homogenization of varieties, you know, the, the top um, 15 international varieties yeah. account for something like 70% of vineyard plantings all over the world. And and there can be great varieties, but the, the point is we are also losing that kind of diversity. Yeah. Um, and absolutely, the more I have researched this, the more I've realised it's not just that good, it has to be good. Just because a vineyard's old doesn't mean it's good, but when it is old and it's good, absolutely yeah. brings depth of flavor a certain balance um, a vitality in the wines but also other kinds of depth you know cultural depth um what the un describes as um biocultural heritage you know links with local and traditional agricultural practices mm -hmm. and there is a really big trend all over the world, in all aspects of food, 
production to start valuing this because the way in which obviously highly efficient in many ways very necessary intensive agriculture has developed yeah it has meant that we are in danger of you know we say in english throwing the baby out with the bathwater and wine can be part of this conversation and i think we should be part of that conversation yeah no absolutely i mean when you talk about good vineyards and uh, good sites it makes me what, what, what are the risk for this old vine that they live throughout their life what are the risk for them to for old vine not to be come an old vine yes that's a, a really good question so um the i mean i know i've been talking about the south african old vine project a lot but it's just that they have done a lot of work on this and the research that they found is that um there's a kind of critical period at which even a a healthy but maybe unfashionable vineyard that gets to about 30 years of age certainly in South Africa could will you know may well be or was being grubbed up um the that kind of 30 year old certainly has been found in the new world to be a kind of point where Perhaps it also if it's if it starts to intersect with a new trend in wine, a fashion, you know that people think, oh well, let's get rid of this Chenin Blanc, and um, and and plant Sauvignon Blanc instead. Um, that around that kind of age, thirty years of age, is a point when actually many vineyards are grubbed up, and that's why. For example, not just in the South African Old Vine um, project, but also in the Barossa Old Vine Charter, their classification of old vine starts at about 30 years because they want to bring good 30-year-old vineyards into, you know, under protection so that they can become 40 and 50 and 60-year-old. Because yeah. uh, there is uh, this uh, same thing and then when... Uh, after about the balance uh, from a vigorous uh, after a certain age of the vine and sort of sl- not slow down but it produces a bit less and you have the risk of not being so valuable for high production high volume that's one want... of the concerns although what we found what we were what we were told in the le- the most recent conference when we were listening to Dylan Grigg and the presentation of his research, is that it's not inevitable that there's a drastic reduction in yield from old vines. He found, for example, that um, um, the pH of grapes from um, older vineyards tended to be uh, lower, so therefore um, more conducive to, to freshness. Um, he also, um, and oh, there's also some new research that's actually been conducted in um, California, which shows that essentially, I'm simplifying, that older vineyards with their deeper root system and with their thick woody trunks and reserves have a reaction to drought um, and kind of extreme weather that is just more moderate than with younger vines. Um, so the other thing that we have discovered, and this was from the first conference when we had a presentation from Marco Simonit, who is um, a master pruner, yes. and <laughs> he and his um, colleagues, his part, his business partner Pipalo Sirch, they are basically they, they kind of look like hipster pruning heroes, but they work all over the world, actually retraining and repruning and teaching how to prune for long life because there's a real epidemic in certain parts of the wine world with fungal diseases such as esca and esca is basically introduced into the plant and spread and and spreads through pruning wounds and 
so there's a I mean this is a whole other thread there's a level yeah, of you know I'm, I was going to geekery. I, I um, was going to invite yeah. uh, Simone to one point to the show because I actually I uh, see, I saw him talk and it was super interesting and definitely at one point at some point I will have him coming and talking but absolutely I know then is you can find your uh, on your website uh, on the old vine conference dot com uh, dot org dot org yeah dot it's org. Dot org. Oh, yeah, oh it's old old vines dot org yeah thank you <laughs> That's it. You can find them and online as well. So you, um, I'll be sure to link everything and uh, some some of the researches as well. If you have them, uh, I will be happy to link. Yeah, there's them. some good resources on the website now. So we have um, uh, links to all the organisations such as Barossa Old Vine Charter, South African Old Vine Project, Save the Old Campaign in Lodi, the Vigno <laughs> Project in Chile with Old yeah. Vine Carinan and Mole. Um, also links to some really good articles on heritage old vines. And I, if I could, could I just mention that Jantis yeah. Robinson, Master of Wine, has been writing and championing the, what is called the irreplaceable resource of good old vineyards for about 15 years. And she has chosen as the theme for her writing competition this year old vines yeah. and she's had over 100 entries about great old vineyards so do check out Jantis robinson as robinson's website as well which is jantisrobinson.com yeah because they are now publishing their their shortlist it's becoming a something of a global it's a global concern and there is people really taking on and I was very impressed when you did your first conference after like a few days of the reaction from press all over I saw them especially in the UK and I find I found it super interesting and I was I'm very happy to be here and trying to do my my part and promoting Thank your you. project and the old fine project because I I do I have tried many old vines and I did see the difference and I value them and so I think as a beautiful heritage especially for as you were saying for the preservation of all the varieties the most some of them they only find an old vineyard an old vine so you can't really grab them up and uh, i just had one last question because i think you might be able to help me i know then um what, what is the risk of uh, having uh the, we have now in uh, this stage of risk of like Pulling up, uh, big pulling up systems like uh, in uh, the early 2000s with like uh, Carignan in south, southern France. You know, there is any of this yes. risk or do you feel it's a bit more cons oh, less well, concerned now? As um, Elias Lopez Montero, who is a winemaker and winery owner in Spain, in La Mancha, told us that they're losing, you know, thousands of hectares a year. And... In Spain, there's a risk in Portugal. They're losing a lot as well. Um, and um, yet um, our speaker, um, Tiago, who came on in the first conference, was very uh, persuasive, very um, passionate in his call for that to actually be understood in, um, in Portugal. And one of the uh, kind of one of those weird, bad quirks of fate is that um, as Europe has kind of started to share, you know, wealth and investment, which is great. Okay, I'm a fan of that. But as it started to share, what, what um, actually happens is that for many wineries, for example, in Alentejo, which is a really kind of beautiful, it's really rural part of Portugal, and wineries who received funding for improvements to vineyards one of the conditions of funding is that they had to start completely from the beginning so they had to rip everything up and start again and I mean I I should just say I'm not sentimental about it um there are some vineyards that happen to be old but they're not great <laughs> you know they it's the wrong variety or it's a not a great clone or you know it's not in it's not a great site but when they are great 
they are really the pinnacle, they're the nexus of everything that we love about, most about wine. Um, but yes, there's, uh, they're being lost. Um, and the diversity of many varieties is being lost. And there is a small niche community of people who really care about this stuff, you know, in, in every part of the world. You know, the Australians have the alternative varieties movement, but they are, you know, they're, the, they're like the crazy artists shouting in the corner. But, you know, if you get a lot of crazies together and they can show actually how beautiful and unique and exciting the wines from these vineyards are then you can turn that tide i think oh, absolutely i i saw some of this example in uh, when i was in chile last year with like the small producer in vino and now having some of the biggest the top four producers yes. in uh, chile starting to exactly. do exactly their own, they have the old vine, vineyard, they used to have them for blends and now they're using them for their own wine and trying to promote them. Vigno, you have Vigno, you have other associations in Chile. I know Chile because I know Chile quite well, but yeah, no, it's very interesting. And also, I think it's, uh, when you were saying, uh, as we closing up, I think when you're saying ad adopt the old vine, I think you were talking about uh, Domaine Jones. Uh, I I have I have interviewed her on the show, so I if you if for my listeners to, to go and check uh, the episode with uh, uh, Katie Jones because it was very interesting and she speaks about buying at this old vineyard in Fitu and getting our story together. It's very fascinating. So it was very interesting. Sarah, I mean, I really enjoyed having you on the show. And if there is anything, if there's anything you think you we miss uh, just let me know now and it would be a happy oh, no, to I think, add it i think it's been great i've really enjoyed talking to you you've asked me so many great questions and you know thank you for the chance to share this with you and with your listeners and um and i hope to be able to welcome you to the next virtual old vine conference in september 21st and 22nd and do take a look at our website for anyone who's interested it's www.oldvines.org and also do take a look at chancesrobinson.com where you can view all of the shortlisted entries for the old vine wine writing competition it's just like the most beautiful fairy story of Okay, I'll, uh, of, I'll of, of wine I'll, heritage yeah. <laughs> but it's I'll not even a fairy story it's notes. real <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> no, no, I'll add it on the show notes so that they'll be able Fantastic. to the listeners will be able to find it okay Sarah thank, thank you. you thank you so much my pleasure thank you and I hope to see you in person soon me too thank you take care you listen to the looking into wine podcast discussion on the values of old vines with my guest Sarah Abbott. Make sure to read the show notes to find the links to the old vine conference. If you're finding the podcast valuable, remember to hit the subscribe button and to tell your friends. You can find Looking Into Wines on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music and every major listening app. If you're enjoying the podcast, you can donate on mattiascarpazza.com, music produced by Samuele Di Nardo, Editing and Mastering by Tommaso Ascoli and I am your host, Mattia Scarpazza. This Halloween. No, that's impossible! Don't get caught. Did you check the basement? Or the bedroom? Without the perfect thing. They're both out! To treat every taste. Well, that's it. We're out of Fanta. This Halloween, don't live with the horror of being without Fanta. Get yours today. This Halloween. No, that's impossible. Don't get caught. Did you check the basement or the bedroom? Without the perfect thing. <laughs> They're both out. To treat every taste. Well, that's it. We're out of Fanta. This Halloween, don't live with the horror of being without Fanta. Get yours today.